Our next speaker is Dr. Philip Bagus. Dr. Bagus is actually a former Mises Fellow here at the Ludwig von Mises Institute. He received his PhD at the University Rey Juan Carlos in Madrid, Spain. He is the author, co-author of Deep Freeze, I I Iceland's Economic Collapse, and he's the author of The Tragedy of the Euro. Dr. Bagus won the 2011 O.P. Alfred Prize for Libertarian Scholarship, and he's going to be lecturing to us today, this afternoon, on the topic of money. Dr. Bagus. Thank you, Mark. Well, hello to everyone. Thank you, Mark, for the nice introduction. It's a, very, it's a great pleasure for me today to speak to you, because, uh, especially because it's, in some way it all started here. Like 11 years ago, I was sitting where you are sitting now. It was my first Mises University, and if you look around, there's a, there must be a group photo picture still where a very young uh, guy, that's me, uh, looks uh, on you very impressed by, I was very impressed by, Mises, by the Mises University. So I hope you will also be, and maybe some of you will also in some years change, change sides. Well, my topic is uh, money. So, and in order to understand money, it's very useful to look at its origin. How did money evolve? And the first one who explains the evolution of money from a genuine entrepreneurial perspective was Karl Menger in 1871. For him, this process was just an example of the evolution of all institutions. So he takes money just as an illustration of this process. And the origin of money based on individual actions is also very important because it shows us that the typical divide between micro and macroeconomics that the mainstream uh, defense is totally superficial. Uh, there's only one indivisible science of economics. So money is a totally normal good. It is a common and generally accepted medium of exchange. So what is, the, what is money's origin according to Karl Menger? To forward the conclusion to you, money evolves in a market process of human interaction over an extended period of time. So money has not been deliberately designed or invented by anyone. So money is like language or morality or law. It's an institution that evolves over a long period of time thanks to human interaction. No one invented German or no one invented, in, invented English. Shakespeare didn't invent English. No one invented morality and no one invented money. And Menger was the first one to explain in theoretical terms how institutions evolve as a result of human action. And he illustrates this with money. So how is this pro process precisely? In order to understand it, it's good, uh, useful to make a thought experiment. Let's uh, imagine that money would not exist. How would the world be without money? Everything else is the same. So the buildings, the streets, the factories, the machines, they are all there. Of course, it's a very difficult experiment. It's similar to imagine how the world would be without language. How would the world be without morality, without law, without religion? So without money, if, we, if I leave the Mises Institute, Let's say I'm thirsty and I want to buy a Coke. I have to find someone who has a Coke and sells it. So when I cross the street and I look around, I finally will find, see McDonald's. So great, no? They probably sell a Coke there. But this is, that is not enough. No? Because I have to find someone who not only sells the Coke, but also wants something that I have and which is not money, because money does not exist. So perhaps I could offer the guy at McDonald's in exchange for the Coke a lecture on Austrian business cycle theory, <laughs> but he may not be interested in that, especially because it's not very useful in a world without money because there's no 
Og sugar is a Or let's take another example. Mm. Let's simple example. Let's imagine a baker who wants to go home, and he wants to take a taxi to go to go home. Uh, so he asks, asks, asks the taxi driver, "Can you take me to my hotel?" The taxi driver driver responds, "Yes, sure, but what do you offer me in return?" Uh, the baker says, "Well, here I have a very delicious love of bread." Uh, and the taxi driver says, well, but we still have bread left over from yesterday. I don't really need bread. Okay, says the baker, what do you need? And the uh, taxi driver says, well, I have a daughter who has failed twice the economics exam at the university. <laughs> and I really want her to pass it. So the taxi driver, uh, uh, as the baker says, well, okay, but I don't know anything about economics, but I have heard good things about this young economist, Philip Begos, <laughs> and maybe he can help your daughter. But you must imagine at the same time, the, the, the door of the taxi is still open, the, the, the motor running, the engine running, environmentalists going crazy. <laughs> so the, the, the baker calls me, hey, Professor Begos, can you uh, give uh, a lesson to the daughter of the taxi driver because he wants her to, uh, to pass the exam. Okay, and I say, sure, but what will you give me in return? Well, a loaf of bread. That's why I'm a baker. I say, well, I, I don't need bread, but you know, I'm a, I'm a German, so if you give me a barrel of beer, we are fine. It's, it's a deal. So the baker has another problem in thinking, but but he has a, an old friend uh, that, by coincidence, is a, is a brewer. So he calls him with his cell phone. Hey, do you remember me? I'm the baker. Could you sell me a barrel of beer against bread? And we could expand the example more. But let's, let's say okay, the brewer says, well, OK, I need bread. Sure, it's a deal. So then the, the problem of the double coincidence of wants is solved. Huh? The exchange can be made. Uh, the baker uh, sends the bread to the brewer, the brewer sends the beer, the beer is sent to me, I give the lesson to the daughter of the um, taxi driver, and the taxi driver drives the baker home. Done. <laughs> so you see, in barter, there are actually two, three kinds of problems. One is uh, uh, the coordination of space, because you need to find an exchange partner. Well, it's easy if you have the phone number and you just call the people. Um, so there's a location, then there's a temporal problem, because the taxi driver wants to drive home now, but maybe the daughter won't, needs the lesson in one month. And the baker needs to sell the bread now, and wants services later. And there's also a quantity problem, when goods of different value are exchanged. Because here, one loaf of bread is, against, is exchanged against one of my lectures. I'm not sure what Jeffrey Hovner told you about subjective value theory, but this can't be true that one of my lectures is worth a loaf of bread. <laughs> so there's also different quantities exchanged there, which is a problem in Bath. So think about it. A very easy exchange, uh, get, taking a taxi, it's very complicated, and we, we make dozens of those every day. So without money, the world would be very complex, very complicated. The cost of exchanging, <laughs> what mainstream economists call transaction costs, would be so high that the majority of exchanges would not be made. We would live in a world of subsistence economy, producing most of the stuff for our own. Because the problem of the double coincidence of wants requires that we find someone who exactly needs what we have and vice versa. And at the same time and the same quantity. Without money, it's very difficult. Indeed, there are some things uh, in our world that cannot be bought and sold against money. In Latin, it's res extra commercium, like love. No? You cannot buy love. You can buy sex, but not love. With money, it is easy. Uh, I go to the supermarket and say, well, this is a very beautiful tomato. 
I buy this, give the money, end of story. But there's no supermarket for girlfriends where I say, well, I want her and, and, end of, and I pay end of story. There the problem of the double coincidence of wants is more, more pressing. Yeah, you need to find a girl that has what you want and at the same time values what you can offer in return. Yeah, it's extremely, extremely complex and a trial and error process. I imagine that buying a tomato would be as difficult as to find a girlfriend or a wife. Uh, and we are so, so used to money that we assume that it has always been there and always will be there, but that is not the case. It has not always been there and it has no guarantee that it will be there in the future. Uh, it basically dis uh, disappeared actually in the early Middle Ages. So without money, the other person has to have what we want and need what we have. Uh, and with love, marriage, this is very difficult. You have to look for another and another one, another one, much energy, uncertainty. It's a very difficult process. So imagine a world where buying anything would be as difficult as getting a girlfriend or, or a boyfriend for that matter. So we would live in a subsistence economy uh, and with a small amount of barter. But there was not always money. But human beings are very inventive, they're very creative, they're looking to improve their future. As Mises would say, they say they try to remove their felt uneasiness. So human beings discovered that in a world of different goods, different talents through specialization, in the, in the production of goods where you have a comparative advantage, you just heard it by Professor Hultzman, both parties or all parties gain in well-being. So through specialization and exchanges, we all, we all gain. However, the division of labor or knowledge is based uh, on money. So how do you solve this problem of the double coincidence of ones without money? You have to think that any coordination problem itself is a profit, or profit opportunity to be there exploited by profit-seeking entrepreneurs. So human, human genius is able to solve the problem of the double coincidence of wants. And in human history, there, has been, there have been um, some unknown anonymous heroes who started to tackle this problem of the double coincidence of wants, and we are indebted to them forever. Actually, they should get, these heroes should get the monuments that are reserved nowadays to mass murderers like Abraham Lincoln, Napoleon, or Stalin. So in the, beginning, in the beginning, there are only a few entrepreneurs in a certain location of time and place that tackle this problem of the double coincidence of ones. And they discover that they can attain their ends more effectively if they, in exchange for what they sell, they are willing to accept something that they do not need directly, but rather a good that is more marketable, a good that is more easy to sell at their time and place. So they de demand in exchange for something that they have, not the good that they want, but the good that they have observed that is exchanged more easily in society, which is easy to sell. And this concrete good in the beginning can be of very different kind. So when these people get this concrete good, then they use it to sell it with more ease against what they need, when they need it. So this is the essential idea. The good, and this good can be anything. This can be grains of wheat, tobacco, cattle, slaves, metals, whatever. So I sell my production, let's say I'm a tomato producer, and I will not demand what I need directly. Let's say, say I need a tie, I need a tie, but, but I sell the tomato against wheat because I have observed that wheat is exchanged more frequently and can be sold more easily in the market. So once I get the wheat, I will take the wheat and try to buy the tie with it and other goods and services. Of course, this is a process of, of entrepreneurial process of trial and error. It must not be successful. I may not find someone 
willing to sell me the tie against the wheat that I just got at the original price. But let's say it's successful and I improve my situation. And then transaction costs are lowered. I don't lose my time finding someone who wants tomatoes and offers ties. And as the action is successful, I will, I will tend to repeat it. And other human beings will learn, might learn from it and copy me. Indeed, we, of, we often look what friends do, what family does, what the rich and famous, the successful, the stars do. That's a human characteristic that in its exaggeration converts into envy. But it has also its good side, namely to be up to date, to look what the others are, are, are doing. So there will be a second wave of entrepreneurs, of actors that learn, copy, and adopt their behavior of the first innovators. And when they sell their stuff, they don't ask for something they need directly, but a good that is more marketable, like wheat. And when they have success with this strategy, they repeat the actions and others copy. And then a third wave of entrepreneurs comes and adopts this strategy. And slowly and gradually, more and more actors use a certain good as a medium of exchange. So this good gets an additional demand. It's not only demanded as a consumer good or as a factor of production, but also as a medium of exchange. So the wheat, for example, is not only demanded to, to eat it or to use it in production, uh, to produce bread with it, but also to safeguard it in order to use it in the future as a medium of exchange. Of course, this process of the evolution of money is not a linear process. There may be actually several medium of exchange at the same time, <coughs> because there may be several goods that are quite marketable, easy to sell. So there's a competition. When I sell my tomatoes, what do I ask for in return? Maybe there are four goods that are quite often exchanged. Let's say there, there's wheat, there, there are cows, there are slaves, and there's metal. So when I sell my tomatoes, what do I, what do, I do? Do I demand? It's a process of trial and error, a competitive process. But there's a tendency of one commodity to prevail, of one good to prevail. Why? Well, simply because if there are still four of them, wheat, cows, slaves, and metal, the problem of the double co coincidence of ones is still very pressing. Let's imagine I sell my tomatoes against wheat, and I need the tie. Then I need to find someone who sells ties against wheat. However, there may be some people who produce ties and, but, and sell them, but only against cows, metals, or slaves. So maybe there's someone who sells a, a tie uh, against slaves, and now I have the wheat, so I, first I have to find someone who's, who sells slaves against the wheat I got. So there's a tendency, as Rosbart says, uh, of one commodity to pre prevail as money, as a common and generally accepted medium of exchange. And what was the world currency before the nationalization of money? Gold. Gold was a common and generally accepted medium of exchange. In a largely competitive process, it had become money. Of course, if you would now return to gold, there's no guarantee that gold would be money in the future because the competitive process would continue. But gold was the money. So let's sum up um, with three characteristics this competitive process in which money evolves. First, money is the result of a spontaneous process. Spontaneous in the sense that it's not a deliberate creation of human beings. No one was able or wanted to invent money. No one wanted to create it. When this person in history exchanged his tomatoes against wheat, because wheat was more marketable, he did not want to create money. He just wanted to improve his life. He wanted to attain his personal ends more effectively. So this is a wonderful thing. Think about it. What makes our life and society possible today, institutions like money, morality, language, have not been the deliberate cre creations of human beings, as Menger points out. These actors just wanted to attain their personal ends, support their families, and so on. 
And they contributed to a very long process in which money, language, and morality evolved. Money neither is the result of a social contra contract, so that people come together and say, well, this bar is a total chaos, um, let's use gold as money. Never happened. Money is neither a creation of the state. The state had nothing to do with the creation of money. The state has only intervened very recently, rather recently, uh, and made it with money when it was nationalized. The second characteristic is that money is a social institution, probably the most important social institution, because it's the very basis of society. Without money, we would exchange almost, or only very few things. We would produce most of the stuff for ourselves. There would be almost no division of labor. We would be very poor. 90% of mankind would, would die. With money, exchanges increase exponentially, as does the division of labor and productivity. People go to markets, start to trade, don't live in their valleys anymore, separated, have to communicate. Uh, languages evolve, contracts uh, evolve, law evolves, and all this why? Because of money. So many people say that money is the root of all evil. No, it's the opposite. Money is the root of all good. It makes life and society and civilization possible. Third characteristic, which good money is in a certain period of time is a historical question. So in ancient Egypt, it was grains of wheat. In North America, it was shells. In the times of Abraham and of the Bible, it was cattle. Remember, the Bible says that he has so, so many cattle. It was, he was a millionaire, the, the Bill Gates of his time. Um, in Colombia, it was cacao. But slowly metals emerged, uh, copper, silver, and finally gold prevailed. So why gold? Is it just a coincidence, as some people believe? No, there are some objective characteristics that make gold the most suitable medium of exchange. A good money, a good money must fulfill the services of money very well. The services of, of money are to act as a good as a medium of exchange, as a uh, unit of account, and as a store of value. And for this, a good money must be more or less stable in value. Because imagine I sell, imagine I sell my tomatoes to buy wheat, and tomorrow I go shopping for my tie, but in the meantime, the price of wheat has collapsed. So there should be no big changes in supply and demand. And if there are, Changes in supply and demand, the price should not be affected very much. So in this sense, what are the characteristics of gold? Well, first of all, gold is a very good store of value. It's extremely scarce. You have to move tons and tons of earth to, to get very little gold, a little, very little amount, small amount. So the supply and demand do not affect the price of gold very much. For wheat, for example, there are big changes in supply as the supply of wheat is consumed. Every year the, the wheat is consumed, then there's a new harvest for gold. No, not. The old harvest is still there. The old harvest of gold is still there. All gold produced in human history is still there. So the stock of gold is huge in comparison to the annual production, which is only 1.5% of the total existing gold stock. And a good money must also be resistant to changes in demand. And gold has a very strong and stable demand, as it is used for jewelry, but also for industrial production. It's a very good electric conductor. Only copper and silver are better conductors. It's used, it has been used in medicine since ancient times. In optics, it's a very good reflector. In food, in commercial chemistry, electronics. So when the demand for gold changes, the price of gold is affected. Not very much affected. And this is not so with other goods. Let's take an extreme example. Books written in a language that has already been died out. Uh, ancient Greek, maybe. So here, if there the demand changes, the price will change violently. 
for gold not gold is very is highly liquid that is the bid ask spread is very very low that is the, the spread between the price you you buy it and you sell it is very low and it increases very slowly with increasing quantities this is uh, that uh, this 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 is high um it's high marketability other sco- other goods do not have it so if i buy for, for example a book written in ancient greek i i pay 100 dollars and if i want to sell it the next moment it might be that i have to accept uh, 50 dollars as a price so it's a huge spread between the bid and the ask price and when the quantity increases it, it goes up even more let's say i want to buy 100 books written in ancient greek i might have to sell 500 dollars for any one of these and why of course it's difficult to get them and if i want to sell uh, 100 books greek books a- at once i might get only 10 dollars for any one of them for gold it's very different d- d- uh, different the bid ask spread spread is very low and with increasing quantities it increases very slowly and as gold is a good store of value and is extremely scarce the transportation costs are very low imagine you want to buy a car if you pay with grains of wheat maybe you have to come with a truck or several trucks of wheat to, to pay if you pay with gold probably 30 gold coins well, that's enough. And this implies not only that the transportation costs are very low, but also the storage costs are very reduced because there's much value in a small amount. Second characteristic of gold is it is homogeneous. That is, all its parts are the same. Cattle, slaves are different. I mean, they are, they are ugly, beautiful slaves, old ones, young ones. You have to look at them. The teeth, if they're okay, if they're healthy or, or unhealthy. Uh, diamonds, they are good to store value, but they're not homogeneous. Every diamond is different. Uh, the third characteristic of gold is its high divisibility, formability, and malleability. So the possibility to change its form. Gold is very easily divisible. It does not lose in value when it's divided. If you divide cattle or slaves, they lose in value. And it is also easy to form by, by pressing. That is, uh, ductibility, ductibility is very high. It can be stretched into a, to a wire, so gold leaf is possible. You can form a very thin sheet with it by hammering without breaking it. And even though it's quite resistant to wear and tear, you can melt it, change its form. Uh, with one, 1064 degrees uh, Celsius, you, you can melt it. Uh, I, I don't know how much this is in Fahrenheit, but it's pretty, <coughs> it's pretty high. For, for platinum, it's even higher. So platinum is also resistant, but it costs more to melt it. That's 1,768 degrees Celsius. So while it's quite resistant, you can change the form uh, relatively easily with gold. It's like the, the, the perfect mixture. Fourth characteristic is its recognizability. And the quality of gold is easily, easily recognizable. You can bite on it or you have your weights to see uh, its, its quality. And for for diamonds, you have to be an expert to or for cattle to see their quality. And the fifth characteristic is <coughs> um, its indestructibility. Even though it is divisible at rather low cost, it is indestructible. It's a chemical element, and this is important because you store it in order to buy something in the future. Almost no other good is as resistant. Imagine a, a Spanish galleon sunk into the Atlantic 500 years ago, and now you take it back, back up. So what has happened? Well, the cattle has died, the slaves have died, the wheat, uh, you cannot eat it anymore. Uh, 
the silver, even, even the silver oxided and the gold, you brush away the sand and it's as brilliant as 500 years ago. So this is why gold is the perfect money. If it would not exist, you would have to invent it. It seems almost as gold had been created for this purpose, to be, to be money. So now, the second part of my lecture, I will analyze the character characteristics of money uh, following Ludwig von Mises in chapter 17 of Human Action, where he makes several points. The first one he makes is that money has to be studied in the same way as all other economic goods. That is, all economic laws apply to money, especially the, the law of marginal utility. And this is a difference to neoclassical economics, uh, who thinks that money is a different good which requires a different method. Therefore, money has to be studied in macroeconomics. Money would be like a wheel on the real economy and would have a neutral character, at least in the, in the long term. It would have no effect on the structure of relative prices. So the, they, the neoclassical economists, study the aggregate demand and aggregate supply of money. You study the aggregate the supply of money and it changes of its size on, on the general price level. So they do not take into account that the value of money is determined by subjective valuations. Second point, the motives to, for, to demand money. Money is a medium of exchange. That is, it's not demanded for consumption, neither is it demanded for, for production, but I use it in exchange for a good that, yes, is consumed or used as a factor of production. So what are the motives to demand money? Well, the first one is, uh, have, we have already seen it, in the origin of money, to um, to to solve the problem of the double coincidence of wants, to use it as a medium of exchange. Another reason, motive to demand money, is to tackle the uncertain future. And if the future is uncertain because of, of us, uh, because we are creative beings. We can learn, we create new ends, new means, and therefore the future is uncertain. We may know what nature does tomorrow, the weather forecast, it's not perfect, but one day it may be perfect. But we cannot know what, what human beings will do tomorrow, what the stock market will do tomorrow, for example, because human beings are creative. Therefore, the future will always be uncertain when human beings exist. To tackle this uncertainty, um, we have human action itself and institutions that reduce uncertainty, like law, reduces uncertainty, morality, but most importantly also money, because when I'm liquid, I can react to opportunities or problems. And actually, when there is more uncertainty, we demand more money. So, for example, when you travel abroad, normally you take more money with you, because it's a more uncertain environment, so you take more money with you. And the third reason that Mrs. Names is... Uh, perishable goods. When I produce tomatoes, I don't want to store them for a long time because they will, they will perish. So I, I want to exchange them against money. The third comment Mises makes is, he says that the medium of exchange or money must be scarce. Uh, any economic good is scarce, so is money. But their scarcity is very important. For other economic goods, human beings fight against scarcity, like with cars or computers, and it would be actually good if the scarcity would end. Yeah? Not, uh, not so for money, because once money stops to be scarce, it ends to be a good medium of exchange. And so its conditio sine qua non is that, that it is scarce, and the scarcer the better. Next comment Mises makes is that any quantity of money fulfills perfectly its function as a medium of exchange. Only the, pro the price level will be different. 
So any quantity of money is optimal to serve as a medium of exchange. Of course, when we have private money that is also used for other purpose, purposes, as a consumption good or a factor of production, then in increasing the quantity increases general, uh, the general wealth of mankind. So if the quantity of gold doubles, for example, humanity is better off, since gold can be used for, for other reasons, industrial reasons. But today we have only paper money, so if, we day, if, if today we double the amount of dollars that we have now, do you think we would be any richer? No, we would have the same car amount of cars, computers, clothes as before. The only thing that would happen is that the purchasing power of money would fall. If in contrast the quantity of cars doubles overnight, humanity clearly is better off. Well, Maybe some environmentalists would be, would be worse off. Next comment that Mises makes is that the price of money is called its purchasing power. Uh, and the purchasing power of money can be expressed in terms of any good or service that is exchanged against money. So what is the price of one dollar, for example, in terms of Coke? How much Coke you have to sell in order to buy one dollar. Maybe half a liter. Or what is the price of one dollar in terms of gasoline? The, the owner of the gas station is, is buying dollars with gasoline. <clears throat> maybe, all, maybe, also half, uh, maybe also half a liter. Or, or what is the price of one dollar in terms of a car? You can express the price of one dollar in terms of any goods or services that are exchanged in, against money. And the price of money, of course, is determ determined as the price of any other good. In a competitive process where there are multiple buyers of money, the sellers of goods or services, and mul multiple sellers of money. But, uh, for example, when you, buy, when, you buy a, when you buy a drink, a Coke, or um, a ticket to the cinema, you're actually selling, selling money. One point that Mises also makes is that <coughs> All money is always a property of someone. So it makes no sense to distinguish between idle and circulating money. Have you ever seen a dollar bill running around? In no, no, there's no circulating money, obviously. It's, it's a property of, 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 of anyone always. So uh, idle money is always a value statement. It's made by those people who say, well, you have idle money, you have a too high cash balance, reduce your cash balance because, and give the money to me. That's basically what, <laughs> what they say. And then Mises also says, don't confuse the demand for money with the demand for wealth. Um, I mean, I can say I, I want to win the lottery, 10 million, 10 million dollars, uh, jackpot. But what I really want there is I'm, I'm not demanding money. I don't want to have a higher cash balance of $10 million. What, I, what I'm demanding is wealth. I want to use the money to, to, buy, to buy cars, to make uh, vacations, buy a house. Uh. So don't confuse the demand for money with the demand for wealth. Then Mises says um, the term money market is a terminological error because what is called money market in the press Etc. is a market for short-term debt, for short-term <laughs> credits. Uh, the true money market is all the market where goods and services are exchanged against money and where the price of money is determined. And how is the price of money determined? Well, by the supply and demand. When the supply of tomatoes increases, the price of tomatoes falls. And when the, pr uh, and the supply of money increases, uh, titles valuables, uh, the price of money, the purchasing power of money tends to fall, which means that the price of goods and services expressed in money tends to increase. And then he makes a comment on the equation of exchange, which is MV equals PT. The equation of exchange was developed by Irving Fisher. M is the money supply, V is the velocity of circulation, 
uh, how many times uh, uh, a monetary unit on average exchanges hands in a given period. P is the general price level and T are the transactions. So what is generally assumed that V and T are constant in the short run. In the short run they are constant. So what happens if you double the money supply? <coughs> well, the price level obviously doubles. No? This idea of David Hume that overnight the money balances increase, double. Or the Friedmanian helicopter that spreads some money to, to everyone the same. So the, the only thing that happens there is that um, the prices increase proportionally. Not even that is true because subjective evaluations will change and marginal purchases will also be different. However, there's some truth in this equation of exchange, namely that when the money supply increases, prices tend to rise. However, never, never, ever prices are affected equally. So when the money supply increases, there's always a massive and hidden redistributional effect. And that is why, why we hear people hearing defending increases in the money supply. If, if the increase in the money supply only had the effect of increasing prices proportionally, no one would be in favor of that. Those who want the money supply to increase want it because they don't want that everyone gets proportionally the same amount of money. They want to introduce the money unequally. So now let's talk, let's talk about the purchasing power of money, the price of money. But the price of money is determined by its supply and demand. Let's look first on the demand side of money. Mises names three factors influencing money demand. First, the industrial, the industrial demand to use the good as a commodity, factor of production or consumer good, which now with paper money is zero. Second, the demand to use it as a medium of exchange, today or in the future, and speculative demand, if you expect that the value of money will rise or fall in the future. Of course, the main factor is the demand to use it as a medium of exchange. So the price of money is determined by its supply and demand and mainly by its exchange demand, the demand to use it as a medium of exchange. And this demand um, is not in function of the intention to use it as a consumer good or as a, as a factor of production, but to make exchanges in the future. That is, the exchange demand depends on the purchasing power of money. If the purchasing power of money is high, we demand less money. Imagine that the prices would be half. Price level prices would be half, you probably would have less, uh, lower cash balance, less money with you. Or if the purchasing power of money is low, let's imagine that prices would be double, you probably would have more money with you, higher demand for money. So the exchange demand for money depends on money's purchasing power. And the purchasing power of money is the price of money. So, so you now you would say, well, there's obviously a problem with your argument. Let me repeat what I just said. Um, we want to explain the price of money. It's determined by its supply and demand. And the demand is mainly determined by its demand to use it as a medium of exchange. And this demand to use it as a medium of exchange is de determined by the purchasing power of money, which is the price of money. So what do, did I start? I started to explain the price of money and I ended with the price of money. So I'm saying that the price of money determines the price of money. It's circular reasoning. I'm not explaining anything. Well, what <laughs> I'm arguing yes, I am, because the first price of money is not the same as the last price of money. This is the famous regression theorem that Ludwig von Mises explained first in 1912 in his theory of money and credit. So the price of money today, the purchasing power of money today is determined by the supply and demand of money today. And the demand for money today 
is in function of the idea of the purchasing power we have of money tomorrow. And this expectation of the purchasing power of money tomorrow is based on our past experience of the purchasing power of money. And the purchasing power of yesterday and the purchasing power of money uh, yesterday is determined by the supply and demand for money yesterday. And the demand for money yesterday is based um, on the purchasing power of money the day before yesterday. And the purchasing power of money the day before yesterday is determined by the supply and demand for money the day before yesterday. And the demand for money the day before yesterday is determined by the purchasing power of money the day before the day before yesterday, and so on. So isn't this an infinite regress? No, because we go backwards in time until the moment when a certain commodity started to have a demand as a medium of exchange. So there's neither a circular reasoning nor an infinite regress. So Mises is just doing um, what Karl Menger is doing with the evolution of money. Menger is, do, is doing it towards the future, and Mises is using it backwards to explain the purchasing power of, of money based on its demand, which is based on our experience of what the purchasing power of money has been. So this is the demand for money, now the supply. Let's first talk about commodity money. How does the supply of commodity money increase? Let's say gold is money and gold is found in Alaska. So all many, many people go there to mine it. Miners are going there. And then they produce money, they produce gold, and the money is not spread to everyone in the same proportion, as this equation suggests, but unequally. And it, it extends <laughs> itself only very slowly through uh, the economy. First, the miners get the money and they spend it. And maybe, maybe there's a the bar in the mining town in Alaska. So do you think that the price of whiskey will be the same in Alaska as in New York, for example? The price of whiskey there will be much higher. And then the bartender will get the new money and will buy his suppliers. Um, then, uh, then probably because it's very cold there and they are very lonely, then some ladies will come and offer their services there also. So do you think that the price of these services will be the same as New York? No, they will be much higher. And then when they, they get the new money, they will send it to their relatives and the money will spread, spread slowly through um, the economy. Today the same happens, but on a much larger scale. Uh, because fiat money is produced uh, by the banking system and the central banks on a much larger scale. And today there are basically three ways to inject uh, uh, money. First is the monetization of public debts. That is, the government spends more than it receives in taxes, and for the difference it just prints money. Or the central bank or prints debts that the central bank buys with new money. The second method to introduce new money is that the central bank produces new money and buys stocks or bonds or buys new uh, buildings or pays their staff. Their staff. And the third way is credit expansion. Right? With a central, in a central banking system, the central bank gives instructions to the private banks to grant more, more loans. Uh, more on this, more on this uh, tomorrow. So no one, of, no one of these three ways coincides to inject money, corresponds with the equation of exchange. Because never ever the money is injected equally to all people. Let's say that the government um, gives subsidies to a green energy company. Or let's say that the central bank um, allows fractional reserve banks to expand credits, to build new, new houses. So maybe $10, $10 billion are introduced in the economy, but not to everyone the same. So the, the green energy company gets the subsidies and the home builders, the constructors get, get the new money. They now have a higher cash balance 
but the other people in the economy don't have. And the people who got the new money, they can buy at the old prices. The green energy company, the home constructors, they have higher cash balances and they buy at the old prices and they can enrich themselves. So the new money gets always to a few and the rest loses. That is, that is why no one in, is interested in spreading the money to everyone in the same proportion. Then there's a second level. The money keeps on spreading. So the green energy company may buy solar panels or land or hire engineers, construction workers, the home builders uh, hire architects or construction workers. So the new money then flows to them. They have uh, the producers of solar panels, architects, engineers, construction workers. They have a higher cash balance. They profit, but less. <coughs> then we have a third, we third level. The construction workers maybe buy, buy beer. So, they, so the price of beer is pushed up. The architect buys a Mercedes. So then, then the Mercedes dealer has higher profits. Maybe he, he buys and so on. The, he buys a coat for his wife, so the seller of the coat of, of his wife has a higher um, cash balance. So the money slowly spreads through the whole economy, bidding up prices. And the privileged people who get the new money first gain, because they buy at the old low prices. But the rest of the economy, they see that prices are rising. Christ, the price of cars, Mercedes, of beers, they go up while the income is not rising or not rising as fast. So the privileged gain on cost of the rest. There's a redistribution. And that is why people are in favor of increases in the money supply. And it becomes more, it becomes more profitable, profitable to study uh, architecture uh, or to build solar panels or to build Mercedes. So there's also an effect on the real structure of the economy. Why? Because there will be 100,000 solar panels be built that would not have been built otherwise. Or there will be 1 million houses built that not would have been built otherwise. And once the inflow of the new money stops, because the government, for example, stops the subsidies to the green energy companies, or the credit expansion stops, and when then the money finally extends through the whole economy, there may be no demand for solar panels or the houses that have been built. And then the structure of production has to be realigned again with consumer wishes. So we, you see that you are already at the point of understanding Austrian business cycle like theory here. Because money, new money has always a real impact on the economy. This is even the case for... Uh, this is also the case, of course, for commodity money. So when gold is found in Alaska, there's also redistribution, miners gain, and then the bartender gains, the ladies gain, and so on. Relative prices change. Whiskey rises more than other prices, for example. There's a change in the real structure of the economy. For example, there will be a mining town that not would have been there otherwise. And once the, once the mine is exhausted, the gold flow stops. Most likely, people will leave the place, will be converted in a ghost town. And then there are resources invested there that do not serve for, for anything anymore. And the same, the same and on a much larger scale happens today with fiat money production. There's a massive redistribution from the late receivers of the new money to the privileged first receivers. Uh, the privileged first receivers in our example are the green energy companies that get the subsidies, the home, the home builders. There are relative price changes and the restructure of the economy changes. Hmm? Because the, re the restructure of the economy after the, the injection of money will be different to the structure of the economy that would have occurred uh, without the injection of the money. So money is never neutral. So as you see, money is a very, it's a complex subject and not, man, not many people understand it. And that is why governments can manipulate the supply of money to their and their body's advantage. 
so but now you understand money so please spread the truth it's very important thank you very much